Aloha. Thanks so much for joining us on Think Tech Hawaii. And please support us if you can, because we depend entirely on you. You're what keeps us going. We're here for you, we're here with you, and we're here because of you. You're part of the team, you're part of the Alliance. Help out if and as you can. I'm gonna start today's show because it's the one year anniversary of the Maui fires. And we're gonna take a moment for the 102 identified people, the two that haven't been found and any others, for the thousands of people who have been affected by loss of their homes, their workplaces, their relationships, their loved ones, their friends, their colleagues, by all those whose lives have been affected and by those whose lives have been affected by being part of the litigation and everything else that has evolved out of the fires and the conflicts and the loss that have come from them. So in honor of all those people, and in the hope that they will wind up with the opportunities, the choices, and the resources to be able to go forward with their lives with as much meaning and value as is possible for them and those they care about and those they serve. Let's take a moment. Thank you all for your thoughts, for your caring, for those on and no longer on Maui, those who have not been able to stay. So for today, we're gonna move into something maybe a lot more fun, a lot more positive, a lot more full of good energy. What Jay yesterday called the happy warriors, Kamala and Tim. What's different? Ben, you want to start us off? Well, um, I would start by saying apparently the fundraising is significantly different uh, from uh, before um, um, uh, uh, Biden uh, stepped down and endorsed uh, 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 Kamala uh, Harris. And the fundraising has been really significant since she named uh, Tim Waltz as her vice president. I think they pulled in $36 million in the first 24 hours, which is unbelievable kind of numbers, at least for me it is, you know, maybe not others. So uh, there's clearly a, a, a movement of enthusiasm. You're seeing some large crowds in places like Wisconsin and all that for them. Um, so in many ways, there's, there's these sort of atmospherics that are definitely different. Um, at the same time, you know, it's, it's going to be a real brutal battle all the way down. Um, and uh, you're just watching how the effort is being done now to try to swift vote Tim Waltz. Uh, there's uh, various kinds of attacks on... Uh, Kamala Harris, whether she's Indian or black and all that stuff. And, and you know, it's just going to be very, very nasty. Uh, maybe one of the nastiest ones we've seen since the early 1800s, maybe. But anyway, it, it's, it's a, we are living in interesting times. <laughs> well, as the uh, wonderful cartoonist put it, <clears throat> Kamala has always been Indian and black. Her opponent has not always been orange. Let's talk <laughs> about that. <laughs> okay, so what's different? What's changed with Kamala and Tim Walsh out there? David, Louis. Well, I think it's uh, it's terrific. It's a great it's a great development. Remember where we were? What three weeks ago, um, or four weeks ago? Right after the debate, and we were all depressed, severely depressed. Uh, Joe Biden had just done a terrible job. And the, the concern was, well, what if he gets worse? What if an another month goes by and he gets a lot worse? Then what do we do? And so everybody was depressed. 
everybody was just trying to figure out what to do and the energy level was low and the money level was low and that has all changed now it's all changed um kamala you know for better or for worse uh she is a, a engaging personality uh she she's vivacious she's gregarious she's intelligent uh and she can get out there and she can speak uh and walls is the same governor walls is the same uh he's an everyman he's the guy next door uh he's a good guy and they absolutely have to try and swift vote him uh the you know uh and and, and for those of you who don't remember max clellan who lost both legs uh, in combat um, was swift voted when they when they questioned his military credentials uh, by the Republicans. Just you know, typical dirty tricks, um, and and hopefully we won't see that. But I think the energy level is terrific, and I'm I'm really really happy about that. Can they keep it up? Yes, uh, I I'm sure they can. Uh, how will the populace do? We'll see. There was an NPR story today uh, where they were interviewing people in the swing state of, uh, I think it's Wisconsin, or no, it was Michigan. Swing town, swing county, swing state. And there were a number of people who were saying, oh, I have to vote for Trump because the economy is worse now. Okay? And... You know, the thought was to me, well, gee, you don't understand how the economy works. Trump didn't make the economy better. Biden didn't make the economy worse. There are certain things going on in this world <laughs> that are dictating what's happening in the economy. And electing Trump is not going to bring back some thought of good times. But that is the theory. Make America great again. Bring back Donald Trump. And everything will be hunky dory. We'll roll it back to the 1950s uh, when people of color knew their place. Uh, and and uh, you know, there, there's some great uh, uh, um, economy that didn't actually exist. So people are looking at things with the rose-colored glasses, and they're hoping that Donald Trump will do that. Now that's just terribly ignorant in my view, but you know, not not that many people understand the economy. But I think that um, uh, Vice President Harris and Governor Waltz can do the job. And so I'm very hopeful and I'm very pleased. David Larson, you're right there in Minnesota. If anybody knows who Tim Waltz is and has known for years, what does he bring to the table here? Yeah, I just wanted to say a couple of things. Um, you know, going back to your earlier question, what's changed? Um, I think that before President Biden said he's not going to run. Um, we really had a general malaise that there wasn't a lot of hope in terms of what new could happen. And it, was, it was always a great fear at that point of what bad can happen. You know, and, and when we move on to Kamala Harris, the idea of new possibilities is now in front of us. And that's exciting. Um, and people are excited that um, maybe there will be um, innovations that haven't even yet been discussed. Somebody with a lot of energy. We were very concerned about the energy of the current president. So there's hope. Um, and I think that's one thing that that really has changed. Um, ben had mentioned it's going to be a, an ugly campaign. And I think it, there's a good reason for that, because um, former President Donald Trump doesn't have any policies. I mean, he doesn't have any solutions. He never explains how he's going to make America great again. All he can do is attack. Um, and and when that's all you can do, and you've got a couple months left, you just have to keep attacking deeper and deeper and harder and harder, and more aggressively and aggressively. And truth no longer matters. I mean, it's just just you know, just just threaten and attack. And yeah, it's going to get very ugly. And again, it's because he has no policies. He doesn't have any policies he can talk about. So that's all I can do is a, is attack. And then um, Chuck, getting back to your to kind of your introductory question to me. Um, yeah, uh, Tim, Tim Wallace is, a, is kind of a, is an everyman. Um, he's a nice guy. Um, 
you know, he spent 25, 20 to 25 years in the National Guard, public school teacher, his football coach. Um, uh, you know, he served in Congress. Um, uh, you know, and it's funny, this combination has been attacked as the, the most left ticket in the history of, of America. But you got to step back and say, okay, what's wrong with what Tim Walz has done? Um, you know, he's he's arranged so that all children get free lunches in school. I mean, really, that's that's a bad thing. Um, you know, he's provided protection for those seeking um, gender affirming health care. Really, that's that's a terrible thing. Um, the kinds of things that he's done, or which he's being accused as being too left, you have to step back and ask, what are those things? And what's so bad about that? And are you really unhappy that hungry kids are getting free lunches? Really, that upsets you a lot? Um, so I think that if you step back and kind of deconstruct some of these these caricatures of you know being this great left threat and look at actually what he's done, I think people can be more assured and actually um, kind of feel better about the direction of where things will go. So, you know, we do have to talk about a couple things. Um, you know, the two things that probably will be the basis of a lot of attacks are what happened after George Floyd's murder. Um, and then there was an incident here called Feeding uh, Our Future. So when you talk about what happened after George Floyd got, got murdered, you know, so I think that initial responsibility comes with the city, um, uh, not the governor. And, uh, and then there was some miscommunication early on between who really has the authority here to call out the National Guard. But on top of that, it's not as though the National Guard is a standing army. I and mean, the National Guard is school teachers and firefighters and gardeners and people are at home. Um, uh, they're not standing ready. You know, you, you've got to organize a National Guard call. So uh, the fact that even when the National Guard was identified as the appropriate response, they weren't on the scene immediately, that's impossible. That's not how you organize the National Guard. So, and, and in, a particularly interesting thing is that uh, a phone call has been discovered by um, ABC. And after that incident where um, there was destruction on Lake Street here in Minneapolis, um, Trump expressed support for Walls's handing of the protest. There's a recording of a call attained by ABC News and um, where Trump says Waltz dominated, quote, and praised his leadership as an example for other states to follow. Here's a quote. I know Governor Waltz is on the phone. We spoke. I fully agree with the way he handled it the last couple of days. Trump told a group of governors on June 1st, 2020, according to a recording of the call in which he also called Waltz an excellent guy. So if he's going to make that the basis of his attack, I hope this call becomes uh, part of that discussion. Because after it happened, he was full of praise for, for Walls. Um, the other thing that I think they'll latch on to is there was a there was a group of individuals who said they were going to feed during the pandemic thousands of children, and they didn't. And they ended up buying mansions and Bentleys and luxury vacations and basically stole $240 million from the state of Minnesota. Um, that That shouldn't have happened. It should have been stopped earlier. That doesn't go directly to Tim Waltz, but it happened during his administration. So um, I think that is something that he's going to have to answer for and explain how did that go forward so long. Um, uh, I think it's probably uh, was a problem in terms of the communication within the state bureaucracy. Uh, I just imagine that when the Republicans start attacking aggressively, those are the two things they're going to go after. They're going to go after what happened after after George Floyd's murder. They're going to go after um, this Feeding Our Future um, episode where they've now been prosecuted for fraud. It's a, it's a bad group of people. They actually, it's like something out of the, out of the crime novels. They tried, they got somebody to try to bribe one of the jurors, brought over a bag of like $100,000, knocked on her door, give it to her and say that if you can persuade the jury to acquit us, there's a lot more for you. Um, <laughs> this is all recorded. Uh, so it's a bad group of people that pulled this off.
but but leaving that aside, um, uh, I think he's been a good governor, and I think um, above everything, he really cares for people. He's being criticized today. J.D. Vance called called him a homeless person, and we have a homeless person running for VP because he rents his property. He he doesn't own property right now, and he doesn't and he hasn't invested in stocks. He's not a wealthy man. Um, you know, basically, it's a pension uh, from the military and a and a, you know, pension from being a school teacher, and he lives modestly. and And Vance is claiming that that makes him a uh, an unworthy person, and literally use the word homeless. Um, that we have a homeless vice presidential candidate. So I hope that people across America say that you know, hey, that guy, he's like me. I don't invest in stocks because I don't have that kind of disposable income. Um, you know, and I live pretty modestly too. And, uh, you know, I, I kind of like the idea of somebody like me um, going into the, the going into the White House, and uh, I think I'm going to support him. So that's what I hope happens. Ben, David, your take? What is turning this thing around the way that we're seeing? Funding, polling, everything. Media coverage. What's doing that? David, you're probably much more much better at all this than me. My my take just as sitting here in Charlottesville, Virginia, is uh, the uh, reframing of the idea of freedom in a really interesting way, uh, where you know the freedom to read what you want, freedom to uh, you know control what your body is, you know all that stuff. That's that re re framing of the freedom argument that the Republicans usually only use all the time, I think is one part of this. The other one I thought was really interesting from Governor Walz was he was the one who came up with the idea that's uh, cate you know, characterizing the other side as weird. And that has apparently taken off in people's collective unconscious. And I understand weird is one of those things like uh, in Minnesota, apparently like uh, bless your heart down in the South, you know <laughs> I mean, it, it's it's a it's a pretty stinging thing. Uh, I don't know. That's what I'm reading anyway. But and then the third thing was, you know, he's talking about uh, Waltz was talking about, you know, living in a town uh, where you know basically, you know, mind your own business kind of vision of things that I think resonates to people is like. You know, what are I doing in my life? You know, as long as I'm doing stuff that's legal and all that, that's my stuff, my family, our life. And, you know, these people who want to have the government kind of in in your life dictating so many things, his re the retort they're coming up with is, you know, mind your own business. You know, and that that's relates to the freedom point. So, you know, I, I think that's it. Also, you know, the fact that... Uh, Kamala Harris is in this role after being vice president. And this is the second woman we've seen run for the presidency. We've seen women in the role of vice president. Remember uh, running as vice president, like uh, there was Geraldine Ferraro 20, 20 odd years ago with Mondale. Now we actually had a woman who was a vice president, okay? And she's trying to move up the next step. Obviously, Hillary ran for the presidency before. So it's an interesting dynamic to watch how um, essentially a very male-dominated space is trying to address a, uh, a woman. And she has some great lines. You know, some, you know, if you got something to say, say it to my face. You know, that kind of, I mean, those are really... Very, very powerful lines that she's uh, that she's put forward, and you know, there's the, one characterization I would just say was that when you know, when Joe Biden was uh, running, it was basically the old man versus the con man was the sort of the image that you heard, right? But now with her, it's the prosecutor versus the felon. Okay, that uh, and they and uh, I, I remember Governor Walt said something along the lines that crime was up under Donald Trump. And it doesn't even count the ones he had committed. You know what I mean? I was like, ow, geez, wait. You know, they, they're not, they don't play. So I think that those are some kind of things that are kind of interesting that are going on. The freedom part, the mind your own business, let me you know, live my life, that sort of 
very strongly individual thing and some very uh, tough uh, re retorts to the nonsense that comes out from the other side. Totally agree with that, uh, Ben. Uh, the other thing I would just mention is, is, is that both Kamala and, and Governor Waltz are likable people. They're, they're likable. They don't have high negatives. Hillary had gigantic negatives. And in fact, uh, I think one of the reasons she lost, even though she was hugely competent, was that, you know, 20 years of Republican attacks against her had, had landed. And also, she did not come across as a warm human being. Kamala is much better in person. And she's much better on the stump, and she's much better in in speech making, and just her tone, the way she presents, um, how she talks, she's more likable. So I don't think her unfavorables are as high as prior candidates, and and I think both of those things, uh, for for both of uh, those people, uh, are hugely important. I contrast that with Donald Trump. Who has gigantic unfavorables, and and Vance, JD Vance, you know it's interesting to me because he really hasn't been around and he hasn't really done anything, and so his whole game is I'm just going to attack people and I'm going to say provocative things, and you know he's like I think a stand-up comedian who goes down to all and well let me try this line out. You know, let me let me try and uh, make a joke about racism and use Mountain Dew. Oh, that fell flat. Oh, I'll just move on. Um, but he's just an attack dog who is just trying out new lines because he doesn't have anything else. He has his book. He has the movie. He ha and you know, but all he really has, he has nothing of substance. And so basically, you know, he didn't do anything in the Senate. Uh, and he's just out there as an attack dog. So I, I'm very hopeful there's a lot of people who have already made up their minds. They're, they either hate the Democrats or they hate the Republicans. They either hate, you know, Trump or they just think Trump is, is the best thing since sliced bread. Um, and, and, you know, people are going to vote based upon that. But there's this slice of independence who are going to make the difference. And whether or not the the Harris Waltz team can turn that around because those people were kind of sort of in the Trump camp because they were negatively uh regarding President Biden. Okay? And now whether or not that can be turned around in the next what 90 days um you know, uh, so, and and there is a lot of evidence that a lot of states that that uh, weren't in play are now in play. But can they win? That's the question. It's not enough to just be in play. You got to win. Uh, and if they can win, that'll be just fantastic. And, and I think there's a lot of hope that it can happen. Uh, there's a lot of energy, a lot of volunteers, a lot of money. So I'm I'm very hopeful that that will work out. Uh, in our favor, in the Democrats' favor uh, this year. Yeah, there are a lot of people that were that had been disengaged. You know, they're just they they just were going to walk away. We're not going to vote, and um, I think that has changed. I think there's younger people uh, in particular that suddenly are interested again, um, and I think that's a that's a wonderful development. Um, I, I kind of like the irony of you know, Trump attacking Biden for his age. Um, and his cognitive decline. And now Trump would be the oldest president ever elected. Um, and when you talk about cognitive decline, there's an awful lot of video of very puzzling moments during his speeches where you wonder what he's talking about and what he's thinking and whether he's thinking at all. Um, so they're both really likable. Um, I think that there are a lot of Americans who are tired of these personal attacks. You know, they heard them all through the earlier campaign when Biden ran the first time with Trump. And they're saying, oh, my God, we're going to hear it. It's the exact same thing. It's just these personal attacks. Um, yeah, at a certain point, I think most people say, that's just ugly. That's distasteful. I don't like it. Um, I, I don't I don't want to fall behind this person. Maybe I followed him the first time around. But the fact that nothing's changed 
And despite his promises at the Republican National Convention to move towards unity, that lasted about that long. Um, that was gone immediately. And um, he's doing anything but that right now. So I think people are disillusioned. And I'm not you know, privy to everything that's being said, but from what I read, there's a lot of Republicans who are saying that, you know, I'm, I'm tired of this. I'm tired of this approach. I'm tired of the way he behaves. And I, I'm ready to move on. If I could jump in just uh, sure. uh, on that. Um, I think that the, the really the only policy that Trump has is to give a tax cut, okay? That's basically, and you see all these people lined up who would do very well under a tax cut or the maintaining of the tax cut that he's already given, who are basically just voting that. They will vote for Trump no matter what he does to anybody else just for the tax cut. I, I, you know, and it's amazing to watch just how intense those people are about that tax cut, you know. But that's the sense that I have. Uh, I, I know that I read that Governor Waltz had, run, had a, like a $17.5 billion surplus in Minnesota, and the Republican side immediately said, go to tax cuts, you know. So it's it's their game of, of, going, uh, of going that way. And as far as I could see from his, from his term, that essentially was all that Trump did in his four years uh, was the tax cuts that he did early on. So you got to be, I, you know, that's one of the things going to the economy issue and all that. That's one of the things that I think is is something to, to keep in mind, that there are a lot of people out there betting on Trump, absolutely not caring about any of his policies, only interested in or primarily interested in the idea that he will give them a tax cut. And that's kind of mercenary, okay? And I'm sorry to say it like that. And it's unfortunate because, you know, they, they would give up democracy for that tax cut. You know what I mean? It's just, um, what are you going to do? But they're out there. I think they're out there. I think that's one of the reasons why all those folks out in Silicon Valley all of a sudden jumped on the Trump train. Why? Tax cut. That's all. I mean, they can say anything they want. You know, they can talk about this, that, or the other, or I'm upset about this thing or that thing that the Biden administration said. But it's, it's all smoke. It's all smoke. It's just the tax cut. That's what they want. Anyway, that's the way it, it appears to me. Maybe I'm wrong, but it strikes me. Final couple of minutes here. Let's circle around. David, you want to share last thoughts? Yeah, you know, this idea that we have a surplus, so let's cut let's cut taxes. You know, another thing is that we have a surplus, and so let's try and make the lives better for everyone in our community. And that's what Tim Walz has done. Um, you know, for once in the rare instance where we have the resources, let's put things in place that are going to improve the lives of people that are struggling. And um, so instead of opting for the tax cut, which is only going to really benefit the most wealthy people, um, he's taken the contrary policy to say, let's, let's invest in our community and that'll come back to us. You know, we'll make people's lives better. We'll make children's lives better. And our state will be richer because of that. David, Louis? Totally agree. Um, I, I think that's the, the difference in the, in the emphasis of these candidacies is, is that uh, um, Vice President Harris and, and Governor Walls are looking forward to the future and hoping to make you know, things better and do what is, I think, the critical function of government, doing the most good for the most people. Um, as opposed to just attacking and being divisive and and just trying to come up with with uh, lines that fall flat like uh, JD Vance. So I am hopeful that they will win, and I am hopeful uh, that our country will avoid a misstep into chaos uh, if if Trump and Vance uh, somehow were to get elected. So Ben, last thoughts. I'll say this. I, I hesitated to say this, but I, I would say this. I've been reading uh, a number of books this summer, uh, one of them by a guy named William Hoagland, about the Hamilton scheme going back to the founder's time. A second one is called The German Report by the guy who was the 
prosecutor for uh, sedition of people who were working with the Nazis, uh, Americans who were with the Nazis. He went to Germany after the war and actually went through the Nazi files and found out which Americans, including about 24 members of Congress, were helping the Nazis. Or pre, you know, the America first thing, pre the war, but also during the war. And uh, the third book is apparently there was a guy named Francis Yaki who wrote a book called Imperium. And the thing about this guy was that he was on the Nuremberg prosecution list, okay? He was part of the prosecution team, but he was slipping documents to the defense. You know, he was working for the defense on the Nuremberg prosecution. I didn't know about this guy. Anyway, and I've been listening to Rachel Maddow's Ultra second season, which is all about this, this complex series of interrelationships over 80, 90 years of people trying to uh, essentially go towards authoritarian structures in the United States, okay? And I just found out something when I was listening today, which is that in Kennedy-Nixon, there was an effort after the election to say that Kennedy had stolen the election. Well, Ben just froze, but we're out of time. <laughs> so we're going to wrap it up. And I want to thank all of you, David Louie, David Larson, Ben Davis, for thoughts, perspectives, insights to call to help us understand the incredible new energy, the authenticity, the genuineness that Kamala Harris and Tim Waltz are bringing, the shift in media attention to that new energy, to that constructive action-oriented authenticity that they bring. There's just a whole new feeling to this. And so I think the image in our minds is now, as we go into that voting booth, we don't need Jiminy Cricket to tell us who's the bad guys and the good guys anymore. We know who the good guys are because they not only speak it, they live it. When you do that, Remember in November. David, David, and Ben, thanks so much. And Jay Fidel, our master host, thank you too. Think Tech Hawaii. Aloha. Mm -hmm.